And there you are. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to RBCM at Outside at Finlayson Point today. My name is Liz Crocker. I'm a learning program developer at the Royal BC Museum on the learning team. And um, I'm here today at Finlayson Point with Grant Ketty. And he's, we're gonna be talking about this place uh, was a defensive site, an indigenous defensive site. So we're gonna learn all about it uh, through archeology. span um, uh, but I would like to acknowledge that we are here on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nation. And it's possible that uh, some of their ancestors were the people, the folks that were living at this defensive site. So um, fascinating. And always, I'm always grateful to be able to, to work in this beautiful place. Um, and to let you know that the next program coming up in two weeks, RBCM at Outside, I'm not quite sure of location yet, but we are going to be doing winter birding, uh, especially ducks. So we're gonna find a good location for that. And I'm gonna be with Dr. Uh, Gavin Henke, who's curator of vertebrates at the Royal BC Museum. Join us uh, if you want some winter birding tips. And uh, if you have never joined us before, although I know many folks are getting so used to these kinds of formats, this is webinars. So um, you can interact with us through, through the chat in either Facebook or Zoom. You can uh, send in comments or ask us questions. There will be, we're gonna hopefully have a little time at the end for questions um, and possibly some time for questions as we go along and ask Grant. Um, yeah, and so we're live outside. The weather is excellent right now, so hopefully the sound will remain excellent and the connection seems fairly good. My colleague Kim Goff is in the room and she'll let me know if there's any uh, issues that come up. But I'm going to turn it, things over to Grant Ketty, who is the curator of archaeology at the Royal BC Museum. He's When he gets talking, he's going to take his mask off. I'm going to pop mine on while I'm working the camera. Um, and Kim will, uh, at some point, share some links. Grant has written uh, many articles. Actually, if you go to his staff profile page on the museum's website, um, you'll see all the articles that he shared about BC archaeology. But he's got a couple of them uh, about defensive sites, because this Finlayson Point uh, site is one of many defensive of sites in the southern Vancouver Island region um, and so he's written about those if you want to learn more go online to find those through the links and also on our learning portal there is a pathway in there called can you dig it which uh, has some interesting media and video and images and articles about how to learn about BC through archaeology the archaeology that's been done at the Royal BC Museum um, all right I think that was all I wanted to say about Grant. So I'm gonna turn it over. You'll be able to see him and he is going to uh, tell us all about this place. So I'm gonna turn around and mask up. Here we go. All right, Grant. Good afternoon. If you were here at Finlayson Point a thousand years ago, standing right where I am right now, you'd be standing in a two meter deep trench that was five meters across and this trench went all across the whole back of this bay. And right on the other side, what you probably see is a huge wall of wood uh, made of pillars or sometimes house planks connected to pillars. And this is one of the features of what we call an Aboriginal defensive site. So this is one of about 14 of these defensive sites that were identified years ago in the general uh, territory of the Lekwungen people. Unfortunately, most of these have now been destroyed. So this is one of the ones, at least there's still remnants of it that, that exist. So what I'm gonna do, first of all, is show seven slides and give an overview of the, the archeological work that I was involved in at this particular site. And then uh, I'll show you some of the things that we found here and a little, and the kind of information that they can provide us with. And uh, then we're gonna walk out to the point. And out there, I'll tell you the, uh, one of the rare stories for this area where there is some indigenous information about what went on at this particular site. Thanks, so, Grant. And Kim's just pulling up the slides now. I think she's almost at the, your first slide. So here we go. Now there's the, the showing of Finlayson Point. Okay. So this, this shows the big picture of Finlayson Point. Many of these defensive sites are on a peninsula that's stuck out into the ocean and they have a trench across the back of the back. Some of these were on a, on a bluff. Uh, you can look at the next slide. So this is a uh, drawing by a local artist, uh, Gordon Friesen, uh, who did a, 
picture of what these sort of defensive sites might have looked at at one time. So you can see the big trench across the back. That's like the one I'm standing in right now. Unfortunately, much of this area was built over in uh, 1878 by a, a military gun emplacement. A lot of these, uh, this area was disturbed and the trench uh, filled in. No, the um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see an event that happened in uh, 1976 where the whole side of the hill here collapsed. And what it did is expose all the shell midden underneath it. So that black layer you see along the top of the image is, is includes cultural material that's full of millions of fire broken rock animal bones, artifacts, uh, house features, these sorts of things. So what I did at the very base of that, I got some nice chunks of charcoal and was able to date this site to a thousand years ago. So that's when we knew it began. And around a thousand years ago is when you see a lot of these defensive sites springing up, not only around Victoria, but many areas up, up the coast, right into uh, sites off coast, coastal Alaska. The, uh, so there's really interesting features that you can look at in this. Now you go to the next slide. One of the interesting things that we saw when it collapsed, you can't see any of this stuff today, it's all overgrown, is the actual feature of the trench itself. So you can see in that the soil change that goes into a V-shape down at the bottom, that's the actual soil filled into this trench. So that's evidence of exactly where the trench was. So I was able to measure that and be able, that's why at that point it was 2.2 meters deep. And uh, so this, all this, these landslides kind of accidentally provide a lot of information about this, about this particular site. Um, so the next slide shows the work that we did here in uh, 1992. The city, because the sidewalk literally collapsed over the bank, uh, the, they put in a temporary asphalt uh, sidewalk. Uh, we monitored the excavation of that and the volunteers from the Archaeological Society, we excavated four two by two meter pits at this location. And you see the picture of the members of the Archaeological Society. Uh, many of you probably know Tom Bowen, who's he's the person in the middle of that little cluster of archaeologists working on the site. So we worked with the city in, in uh, getting this work done. Uh, fortunately, much of the surface area was already disturbed. So sidewalk really didn't injure, didn't really destroy much of the cultural material but we did find some interesting stuff below so if you look at the next slide i deliberately put a trench uh, uh an excavation right across where the old trench was and what i was able to find is the ex evidence for a large house post where people had piled rocks against it and clay soil that came from somewhere else and midden from other parts of the site so here's the first evidence of part of what would be in the original wall so those that particular post was about 32 centimeters. So we're looking at a post this this big, that maybe those things were all the way across the whole back of where, where this trench was. So it's really interesting to find that distinct evidence. Now, if you go to the next slide, this is where further up on the site we um, found evidence of the remains of a house underneath, where you have a clear house posts, very large ones, like the one we found up on the edge of the excavation trench, and some very small little black holes. And what those would be is the side of a house where you have big poles and you have small poles used to tie the planks on the side of the house. So this is really interesting evidence of house construction. And the reason it was so easy to see is because the soil underneath was a very light color so any time the indigenous people put a post into the ground where it rotted, there was really distinct black holes showing where those posts were in the past. So we got a lot of information from this particular site. So what we'll do is we'll take a walk up the site here and I'll talk about some of the things that we actually found at this particular site. Now one of the um, most common shell uh, fish that were found at this were oysters. So where do you get oysters? Not around here in this exposed area of the coast. There are, there are no clam beds. There's no oyster shell. So we know the people at this site had to go up into the gorge area to get oysters. And we also find uh, layers of large horse clams and butter clams. 
Uh, where are they getting these? Not around here. They're having to go all the way over the Squamo Lagoon or going up into the area around Cordoba Bay somewhere to get these. So here we have evidence that these people that lived here were going to other places. So I think that they were living here at least sometimes during times of warfare, this was a place they hid out in protected areas and they had to go other places to get resources. Now what we also find in the sites uh, is lots of uh, bone material. So we have herring, which they'd have to put gorge and salmon, all kinds of skulls get locally. We also find remains of seal, sea lion, which you can get locally, and deer and elk as well, and it's a small number of things like raccoon. So there's quite a variety of different food sources to get in here. And one of the interesting things is, of course, the remains of dogs. So uh, we have, uh, we know that in historic times, so before 1850, the women uh, used to raise little white dogs, which they shear every year like sheep and make these beautiful wool blankets. So this is evidence that uh, they had these little dogs uh, at, this, at this particular location. Um, so eventually we can get to a DNA analysis of these bones and actually relate, show how these dogs may have related to other dogs in other sites in this particular area. So it's very interesting every time we find dogs, there's, it's, they're sometimes more important than artifacts and giving information about the site. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Can you can we just have a quick look at those shells too? Um, so you had that. So that's the little so be, the, native this oyster. Is a typical native oyster, and then the very large horse. butter uh, horse clam and butter clam. Uh -huh. And we just we, we can't find these at this location. Right. Thanks, Grant. It's amazing what you got in those pockets there. <laughs> now, <laughs> some of the artifacts we find are kind of interesting. Uh, I brought a whole uh, California mussel shell that I have at home of my own, uh, which I, I use for making tools. Now we find small broken fragments of these that we know where you, so these, uh, you, you grind these down close to the sharp edge, and this would be used for filling fish. So we have evidence of what they're using to fill the fish at this particular site. Uh, we have these tiny little bone uh, barbs that would be used on herring rakes uh, that kind of go along with the fact there's lots of herring at this site, which suggests that because they're using rakes, they're, they're getting this uh, herring in the gorge rather than offshore here. And uh, one of the uh, really interesting things that I like about this site is the net weights. So a couple of these have been found uh, at this particular site. Uh, some of them in the, in the production stage, people started to pound a hole in each side, but they never finished them. So that shows not only they using these on the site, but they're making them here as well. So this was probably uh, one of a series that were used on the bottom of a net that may have been used off, off Finless and Point here. And what are they using to drill that hole? Uh, they're, they're using a, a sharper pointed stone to peck a hole. We did find uh, one large hammer stone here, but it would be too big for pecking this hole. So they use some kind of a small pointed harder stone uh, for pecking up this out of, in fact, all of these are made out of some kind of sandstone that's not really too difficult to work. Uh, so we do know that there was a place called Mukwux over in, uh, further to the, uh, over near um, Macaulay Point, which was a known traditional uh, reef netting station off the point there. We have no information that there was one off Finlayson Point, but I suspect there may have been one here in the, in the past. And certainly there were those small nets at this location, possibly putting these uh, in the strips in the kelp beds offshore here. So you know there one time there was a lot more right. kelp than there is today, yeah. and that's where, where fish hang out. Yeah. So what we'll do is take a walk. Yeah, let's That's go have a look. So this is uh, there were probably houses all over here at one time that were ruined. And one of the interesting things when they put a military establishment in here, the um, the engineer drew a picture of this location and where the trench was was still there at that, that time, and he actually had written he did old Indian. D Ditch. So they actually, the military people actually used the ditch and used that for storing their their gunpowder when they had their other 
guns in this area here. And who? This was in 1878. Uh, it's a We're still using this place right up till uh, about 19, 1892. But about 1883, they ripped the gun in place. And so a lot of the citizens of Victoria were complaining about how they just left these big open pits and were ruining the archaeological sites. We had a, an amateur archaeologist, James Deans. There was no professional archaeologist at this time. And he was complaining most about the site. He had written about these defensive sites and burial cairns that were often associated with him in the past. And people from the Geological Survey of Canada in 1874 visited and recorded. So this site had been known about for many, many years, but it wasn't really officially properly recorded until literally 1970. So when this whole bank caved in uh, in 1976, that was only like nearly six years after this was actually officially recorded as, right. as an archaeological site. So we're going to walk through the site here. Um, underneath the sidewalk in many of these areas here, there are probably still some buried underneath. There's probably some still somewhat intact material left. So we're going to go down to the point here and learn a lot more about the history of this location. The Just pin a peninsula thins out very much here. And uh, this could have been almost like a, it's such a narrow spot. This could have been another line of defense. It's possible they may have actually had a trench across here at one time that got uh, filled in fairly early. One of the things that's unique about the end of this peninsula is what I consider remnants of houses. So you see a bit of a ridge along here. When the, this was all, the grass was all cut and then the brush were here, you could really clear see what I think was the, the rim, remnants of a house rim. This is about nine meters across. When you look at the if you, sorry, Grant, if you stand on that ridge and then yeah, walk down, yeah. I think folks will be able to see how it goes down. It, otherwise, this it's kind of hard to this see. This is probably the rim of the house, and uh -huh. this is probably the inside of the house right here. Yeah, you did so descend. this is something that someday uh, people can excavate to get more information, but hopefully it's a part of this site and it's preserved and, and, and kept intact. Now, if you go and look at the sides of this, the end of this peninsula, uh, what you see is almost the remnants of terraces. When you look along further over, these are really steep cliffs that are constantly eroding away. Uh, what I think these terraces represent, the remnants of them, where there were houses at one time. So imagine plank houses going all the way around this whole end of the point, one up against the other. So they essentially form a defensive wall. So we have some early Spanish drawings on the northern coast where it shows these same kind of things, where it's the defense is not just the bank that people have to, the enemy have to climb up, but they can't get past the houses form a wall around the site. So again, someday we we'll uh -huh. might be able to uh, find evidence of, of that particular case. Well, and the view is obviously beautiful, uh, but you can see a long way off which yeah. obviously this is why they're here, because you can see people coming from both directions from a long way off. Liz, we've lost your sound there. Oh, okay, my friend. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? We lost sound, Grant. I do, hear, hear, I do hear you now. The wind is uh, affecting the, the quality okay. of it. Okay. Okay, you can hear me now? I think so. I'm just going to try to stay out of the wind. I bet it was when I was just out there. Okay. So I'm going to, yeah. Okay. Yes, that's go ahead. Okay. okay. So why were people here? Well, it's mainly for defensive site during times of warfare. Uh, this is an area where you have the open fields behind where you could get lots of canvas bulbs, not only for yourself to eat, but have access for trade. And you could get a wide variety of resources around here. But the main reason for being here 
very much for, for protection. Uh, the story about this is rather a sad one. James Deems, an amateur anthropologist, reported information from a unfortunately unknown indigenous person uh, in the 1800s. And they told him a story that was called Silkus. It referred to a disease that was blowing on the wind and killing people. So they heard this, this was happening in other places. So some of the First Nations that lived over in Holland Point, which is another defensive site uh, to the east or west of here, the people came and stayed in here and others went away. Uh, when the others came back in the spring, they yelled over the wall, they came into the house, and into this area and found everybody dead. What happened? Well, th what this probably was, we know that the smallpox epidemic in 1780 was spreading from the eastern United States up the Mississippi River, the Missouri River, it's spreading in all directions. It came into this area before there were even any Europeans here. And we know when smallpox hits an area for the first time, often it wipes out 80% of the population. So when the, when the first Europeans came here in the 1780s uh, and 90s, they observed smallpox scars uh, on people who were around the age of 14 or 15. So we, we know that uh, that was the epidemic that hit this area some that runs around the 1780s. Maybe it was an earlier one, but it's more than likely that was an earlier one. So we, during the excavation here, in one of those uh, remnants of houses, I've got a date of around 350 years. So we know people were living here from a thousand years ago, possibly off and on, but they're still living here somewhere maybe into the uh, 1600s, but maybe there's some upper layers that are missing. Maybe they were here in, in 1780 when that smallpox hit, but there's no, there's no other tradition other than the mention of this disease came here and, and they found all the people dead. So this is a um, horrible, miserable place to be uh, in bad weather. So. Uh, by having houses all around the side, I think people were well protected from the winds. If you were here in Victoria, you know, last night when there were 90 mile an hour winds, uh, you'd be uh, blown, blown away at this location. But uh, this is part of the history of Indigenous people and Indigenous history is extremely interesting. There's enormous... Uh, changes going on in the past that we're just really beginning to, to learn about. So are there any uh, questions? Yeah, this might be a good time. And hopefully the sound, let us know. Uh, if it gets a little too windy, we can just move back up the path. Great, thanks. Right now it sounds very good. Uh, there's a question about how large the village was. So how many people living in the houses? All we can do is speculate on this. Um, given, I mean, I only excavated part of one house, but given the remnants of these houses and the fact that the, there would have been more houses inside the trench area, you may be looking at, we'd be guessing maybe there were seven or eight houses in here. Uh, there could be different occupations. It could be anywhere from say 30 to 200 people. I would say 200 people would be the most in here. Uh, we, we know that many of the people that lived here were buried on Beacon Hill in these large burial cairns. If you go to the top of Beacon Hill, you can see the burial cairns, the remnants of them still there. Uh, how many, we, we can't judge how many people were, uh, are represented by those cairns because we don't know the time period over which they were placed there. So it's, a, it's just a real wild guess as to uh, uh, you know, how many people lived at this location. That's amazing that there could be that many like in this yeah. spot, but yeah, again, it's, it's why you get lots of, you're getting lots of food stored away for the winter time. Uh, whether the people, there were certain times of the year when, when raiders from other areas came here and, and often it was in good weather. So those are the times that people might've been uh, in these defensive sites and other times they dispersed to other locations. Any other questions? Yes, there's a question here from Christine, wondering about the purpose of the trench, that trench you showed us um, on the landward side of the encampment. Okay. It was just to keep to keep out your enemies that were attacking. So 
if you were attacking this place, you, you had to go into a two meter hole with a 12 foot fence on the other side. So that pretty well kept people out from the land side. And of course, because of the steep banks and probably the, the, the walls of the houses that kept people from attacking from, from the side. So it was, it was all, all to do with keep, keeping out your enemy. Right, Devin is wondering, um, are these sites protected by law? Well protected by law. Yeah, all, uh, all archeological sites in BC are, are protected under the Heritage Conservation Act. Um, one of the problems we always have in these urban areas, there's con conflict with development. Uh, this one is in a park and the, the uh, park officials are very aware of this, done a great job of helping protect it. Uh, they were one of the problems is the erosion of the banks, and that seems to stabilize quite a bit through, by letting the right vegetation grow along the banks uh, that, that helps stabilize it. So this particular site, I'm confident, is going to be protected for some time. But there are other sites around Greater Victoria that are slowly being eaten away bit by bit. Uh, somebody can eat, somebody has a defensive site on part of the property. Uh, they don't have to get a permit to, to dig gardens or plant trees. And you see situations where, where sites are being slowly destroyed by not going through any uh, proper archaeological uh, work. There's, uh, I know there's one out at Tower Point, right? At Whitty's Lagoon Regional yeah. Park. Yeah. So local folks here, if you ever go out to Whitty's Lagoon Regional Park and go to the Tower Point piece, uh, you can see there's, there's, you can actually see the trench quite the well trail. there. Yeah, so yeah. Walking along the trail on the west side of the point, you dip down into a little bit of a trench and up, that's the defensive trench and that went right across to the other side. Yeah. So we have no dates on that site. We have nothing from that site. So it's one that we know very little about. There's another trench embankment on the other side on, on the cliff up above as well, which is probably 90% destroyed now because of housing development mm. in the area that was done right. 50, 60 years ago. Right. Liz, there are two more questions, and the, the wind is a little bit, is picking yeah. up a little bit again. We can go. Um, uh, is there something else you need to show no, us down no. here? Okay, we're going to, you can ask the question and we'll walk up out of the wind. All right. Uh, the first one is from Donna. Donna is wondering, would the First Nation nations in our region be defending themselves from tribes across the, the Juan de Fuca? Okay, we, we know that in historic times, when the Spanish came into, the, into this area, they uh, mentioned about people on the American side at war with people on the other side of the strait. They observed their people's the heads of their enemies were put on posts outside their village. So that was one of the things that was noted by the Spanish right away. Later on, it appeared, the, the, based on stories told by elders much later on, it seems that the, um, a lot of uh, warfare was going on between people in Puget Sound in the south end of the island. The Howland people on the other side were fighting with the Souk, and all of them were fighting with some of the Nichon people further up island. So the uh, some of the Songhees were allies with uh, Cowichan and Clallam, who were much bigger populations that had uh, a large number of warriors. So sometimes they'd all get together uh, and fight people in other areas. But they were a constant threat of being invaded. So what was happening a thousand years ago, of course, we have no information except that which we can find at these locations. Thank you. And Dylan uh, asks, he says, hi Grant, you mentioned hi. that you that you found a number of dogs at this site. Were those purposeful burials? Uh, no, in this case, uh, in other locations, we've definitely excavated very intentional burials. Sometimes they had little burial cairns over them, just like they did with people. But in this location, they were randomly scattered when, when I was excavating around that house post there were two leg bones stick broken leg bones sticking up by themselves now we have no evidence they were eating dogs there uh but i think probably what happened is that their people are digging they're putting in house posts and they accidentally dig up dog barrels that they know nothing about and this stuff tends to get scattered all over the place so it, it's 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 very common to find scattered dog bones all uh, in in archaeological sites in this area. Thank you. No more questions. 
Yeah, and we're, we're at the half hour point. I, I was going to ask you, Grant, I know you work quite a bit with uh, the Songhees and the Squamot First Nation. Is there any oral history that you know of related to this area? Well, there's there's very few, but say this one about the, about this point is, is one of the, the few that exists. You have other places like Sasima, uh, to where the uh, cemetery is in uh, in Oak Bay mm. uh, at Harley Point, where in the beginning of time, uh, Hills the Transformer came along with his friend uh, Mink and, and Raven, and they saw this young person fishing there, and the person sort of rebuked them for interfering, and Hales turned him into stone to be the protector of seals in that area. And then there's another story about uh, well, Samson, where the word where our, the name for the college uh, came oh. from that particular location where a young girl was uh, crying because she had nothing to eat. And different versions of the story. One of them, she's with her grandfather. And another one, she's with her a slave. And they, uh, Hells, uh, when asking her about the different kind of food she wants, she ends up pointing out uh, which ones uh, she wants. So he turns her and her grandfather into stone to become the protectors of uh, those resources in the Gorge Waterway. There are just a very few stories uh, like that that refer to what, what Indigenous people often had different names for what we call what we call the myth age and, and historic things. And that might be the difference we have between uh, history and tradition. Often the tradition has some element of truth, but often it's stuff kind of made up. Indigenous people actually had names to, to distinguish those kinds of things. So those early those early uh, stories in mythological age are very few. And when it comes to place names, uh, there's very few areas in Victoria that have uh, names recorded. By the time people started documenting those names in writing, there were very few of the elders left who, who knew those place names because they were no longer using them. Much more of them are uh, found in Saanich, especially in the Oak Bay area, because some of the some of the Lekongan informants were people that lived there and had some of the knowledge of the names in that location. Okay, so that like Pecals, Mount Doug, they know the name for the, that, but yeah. not in the down here in Victoria yeah. so much. Pecals actually is also this. this, this conflict about that because was actually given by Jim, song of Jimmy Fraser as the name for Mount Tony. So there's we're not gonna get into that. <laughs> we're not gonna get into that. Um okay I'm gonna flip the camera around and and say goodbye unless there's is there any other is there a last pressing question or anything Kim? Not that I see here. Okay. Well thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you Grant and uh that was that was fascinating. I'm, I, I come down here and walk, and now I look at it with a new, a new way to look at this point for sure. So thank you for joining us and hope to see you in two weeks when we'll be talking about winter birding. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Bye-bye. And we are recording this. It'll be on YouTube playlist channel soon. You can always share it with friends. Thanks. Bye-bye.